Hi everyone, today we're going to be looking at kingship in Macbeth and thinking about the different kings that we see and the different types of kingship that we see in the play and their sort of roles and significance and perhaps some wider context um, to do with that. So first thing we need to establish that there is a difference between leadership and kingship. Um, and when we see Macbeth, he is established as a good leader of men, but that's not necessarily the same as being a king. OK, um, and obviously the idea of Macbeth as king has this um, recurring idea. So some of the key words you should be using when you're discussing this. Obviously, we've got Macbeth as a regicide. He kills the king. Um, the divine right of kings we need to um, be fairly confident on. So you need to make sure you've revised that. Um, the difference between kingship and tyranny is really important and the idea of um, the natural order being tied up in the divine right of kings and the great chain of being and things like that. Kingship of uh, kings and nobility and um, the monarchy represent stability um, for a kingdom, the sense of things that can go on across generations, which is really important um, and heavily wrapped up in that and obviously heavily wrapped up in that for Macbeth is the idea of um, lineage and legacy. So who you pass this on to, who is going to follow in your footsteps and that sense of the, having a succession, which Macbeth clearly struggles with. So when we're talking about the idea of kingship in Macbeth, you need to talk about that idea of this is beyond simply being in charge and has much bigger, loftier political ramifications and this has obviously been written at a time where in the sort of 1800 years previously England itself and the um, the kingdom itself had undergone a huge amount of disruption because of disruption to the throne so Henry VIII had created an entire new church based on his concerns about stability and legacy and succession because of um, his wife's continuing difficulties in conceiving a son um, there's then been fights over who ought to rule that's swung from Catholic to Protestant to Catholic to Protestant again. Um, we've had just prior to the um, play being written, the gunpowder plot and the attempt on James's life. And so the issue of kingship and ruling and how important the monarchies and their role within the wider society both politically and almost theologically, you know, how tied are they to this idea of them being God's representative on earth? All of those things were highly political current topics at the time in which Shakespeare was writing this play and are to a greater or less extent explored. Now, Shakespeare is not advocating for revolution. That would be very politically stupid of him. But there are interesting ways he goes about exploring um, the significance of this very political, significant, contemporarily important topic and finding new ways to um, explore it. So we'll start with Macbeth's introduction in um, Act 1, Scene 2. Act 1, Scene um, 2, where we get this impression of Macbeth as a fighter. He is violent. Um, the unseen room from the nave to the chaps bit is obviously the bit that we really like. Fixed his head upon our battlements. He is brave. He is fearless. He's a warrior. But not necessarily a king. So we see this description of him as, you know, he's brave Macbeth. Well, he deserves this name. And he's going through with brandished steel, which smoked with bloody execution. He's clearly terrifying on the battlefield. Um, but he commits these really violent, horrifying acts, which are what get him applauds. And obviously later on, he commits horrifying, violent acts, which are his undoing. So Shakespeare is making quite an interesting point there about how violence is regarded in society and who's approving of it. But fundamentally, I don't think this would serve as a good description of a good king. A king is supposed to be political. They're supposed to put the interests of others before themselves. They're supposed to um, be aware of their subjects. None of that we see here. This is a very old school sort of monarch of someone who is waging clan wars and things. Um, so you could argue that Macbeth's just a man out of time. But here, for the, for the sort of leadership that Shakespeare's audience were expecting in 1606, this would not have been 
a good king. He's a good warrior. My Lord, do you want him in your army? Do you want him leading your army? But this is not a man who is clearly calm and political and can negotiate. What we see here is a fighter, a violent fighter. And then we can contrast that with Duncan, because Duncan, um, and I think what's really interesting is we see this, we mostly see Duncan from Macbeth's point of view. We get this um, section of his soliloquy where he's talking about how he has borne his faculties so meek, has been so clear in his great offices. So he's talking about Duncan's a really good king. And that obviously then affects our response to both Duncan and Macbeth. Duncan hasn't done anything to deserve his death. Macbeth can't pretend that Scotland would be better off if Duncan wasn't in charge. And I think it's really important that Macbeth explicitly acknowledges that. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which are leaps itself and falls on the other. So ideally, you wanted your king to put his, you wanted him to serve the people, to consider his role as someone who is looking after his people. Macbeth explicitly acknowledges the only reason he wants to be king is his own ambition. So right away, Shakespeare is establishing that Macbeth is not a suitable man to be king. He has not got the right temperament. He has not got those kingly qualities, which he acknowledges that Duncan does have. And it's really important that he says all this out loud because it means that later on he can't pretend he didn't know this. He knew Scotland would be worse off. He knew he was doing this for the wrong reasons and yet does it anyway. And Duncan, we see as a good man who is a good king and so the magnitude of Macbeth's crime is amplified there because not only is he killing a good man he's killing a good king for his own personal gain which is really villainous behavior and so it's really important that Shakespeare establishes that Duncan is a good person and a good king um, and someone who deserves that role that Macbeth does not deserve okay um and we don't actually see much of Duncan himself. We see him handing out rewards, um, being magnanimous, being caring, um, appointing Malcolm as his successor. We see him greeting Lady Macbeth and being very charming about her um, home. And that's kind of it, because it's more important that we hear that Macbeth knows that he's a good person and a good king rather than we see it ourselves. So it's really important to have that division set up. Um, and so at this point, this not only elevates Duncan and shows that he is a model king, but also diminishes Macbeth's claim to that position because he makes it into something very selfish and base instead. Um, and so generally speaking, we, as I say, Shakespeare doesn't give us a lot of Duncan. And I think it would be quite interesting for you to have a look at what we do get of him to see whether or not it agrees. And some versions try to make it um, some perform productions try to make it a little different, like the Chris Eccleston one a couple of years ago at the RSC. He was a bit of a lechy old man who sort of kept trying to feel up Lady Macbeth and things. Um, and I thought that was quite interesting. I've not seen it played like that before, but he came across as a little ineffectual, which sort of made you and the audience kind of go, well, maybe Scotland's not that worse off. But to me, that diminishes the division. So it's worth looking at a few different versions of Act One online, seeing if you can see the different ways they play Duncan and how that impacts our perceptions of each of them as a king. <clears throat> so then come Act Three, Macbeth arrives as king. Um, so we immediately get established that he is miserable as a king. To be thus is nothing but to be safely thus. Our fears in Banquo stick deep. And in his royalty of nature reigns that which would be feared. So we see right from the beginning, the first chance Macbeth gets to talk to us, he tells us that he feels insecure as a king and he's worried about someone else taking his throne. Um, Duncan didn't worry about someone taking his throne because he deserved it. He, it was his by right. Because Macbeth has usurped the throne, he's worried about that now happening to him. So we're immediately seeing a king who is jealous of his position, who is scared, who is um, uncomfortable, who is suspicious. So not things that we would want to see in a king. And we see particularly 
he's concerned about this idea of succession. Upon my head they placed a fruitless crown and put a barren scepter in my gripe, thence to be wrenched with an unlineal hand, no son of mine succeeding. So a lot of Macbeth's concerns are about the issue of children. Banquo, remember, it was prophesied, would found a line of kings. So Macbeth is there aware he has committed about the worst sin you can commit. He has killed the rightful king. And for him, it's meaningless at this point because there is no sense of succession, no sense of lineage, no sense of permanence. So when monarchy at this time represents that stability, Macbeth is keenly aware of how unstable his reign is and how um, futile it is to reign just for a few years without having that stability to be able to pass it on to as we saw Duncan had and obviously this play has a lot of children in it and a lot of sons and the one who doesn't have one is Macbeth so we have Malcolm succeeding Duncan we have Fleance surviving Banquo we have Macduff's son being murdered and creating the motivation for him to go and kill Macbeth at the end um, and so we see here the importance of that and how this is tormenting Macbeth that he does not have this succession that the others do because that is part of the role as a king is to found a lineage that he cannot do and we see how he's sort of changed here he's gone from being the proud warrior of act one into someone who is um fearful and angry and frustrated and already blaming everyone else note how he doesn't take responsibility when he talks about the witches said they placed a fruitless crown upon my head as if he didn't have anything to do with getting the throne that the witches have done it to him because otherwise he'd have to take responsibility for what he's done which is obviously a terrible act and so we see kingship here as almost a burden rather than a blessing. We see it as something difficult and challenging and um, oppressive, um, particularly here because, remember, Macbeth shouldn't be king. He doesn't earn it. He isn't deserved. He's not appointed. He's not sanctioned by God. He is a pretender, a usurper of the throne. And so it is important that Shakespeare establishes how it doesn't suit him because it was never supposed to. Kingship is something you were born to as far as um, people are concerned. And therefore, because he has stolen it, he should never enjoy it. Um, we also see the issue of kingship as being part of the natural order and the great chain of being in the play. Um, the, the inversion of the natural order is a massive theme in Macbeth, um, as talked about in the Lady Macbeth video and various others. Um, and in this scene, we see the natural order having been so disrupted as a consequence of Duncan's murder. OK, so Macbeth's murder of Duncan totally destroys the natural order of the world. We have um, sort of day becomes night, horses eating each other. Um, little owls hunting falcons all this sort of stuff so everything has gone very very wrong and Shakespeare has linked these two together really explicitly by placing this after the discovery of Duncan's murder and then you have these two discussing the previous night which is when Duncan was murdered and so we see that Shakespeare is sort of elevating the role of a king to someone who's almost holding the world together and when that is disrupted, the world is disrupted until it can be put right at the end, until we can have that order restored. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting structural point you can make about the fact that Shakespeare is really hammering home, not just that Macbeth has murdered a man, not that he's just murdered his friend, his kinsman. He's also murdered the king and to an extent, therefore, has attacked Scotland herself. And nature is reacting to this violent attack on her um we then get malcolm as king which is quite an interesting um little section in um act um 14 4 i think where macbeth macduff goes to try and talk 
Malcolm into helping him and Malcolm presents himself as these terrible things until Macduff finally has enough as a sort of trick. It's a bit convoluted. But what's interesting is when he then reveals his true self, Malcolm presents himself as almost the anti-Macbeth. So, where is it? Um, I am yet unknown to woman, never was forsworn, scarcely have coveted what was mine own, and no time broke my faith, would not betray the devil to his fellow, and delight no less in truth than life. My first false speaking was this upon myself. What I am truly is thine and mine poor country's to command. That is almost the exact opposite of the attitude Macbeth went into this with. And I think it's notable that it begins with um, he's as yet unknown to woman in a play where the female character who is married to Macbeth, Lady Macbeth, is so dangerous and so immersed in the horrible things that Macbeth does at the beginning of the play. It's really interesting that Shakespeare makes Malcolm an innocent, someone who is a, a virgin, is someone who is unknown to woman, who has not been tainted by women yet. Um, and if you go and watch the Lady Macbeth video, you'll see some of the discussion there about um, regarding the roles and status of women, which will help you with um, looking at why that's significant. But equally, we're forced to ask, is this a good king? I mean, he's very different to Macbeth, but he also sounds like he doesn't really know anything about the world. So it could be that his innocence and purity would be a benefit. But equally, you're sort of there going, well, how political is he? How much knowledge does he have? So he's a purer person than Macbeth. But I think Shakespeare still leaves it a little bit open that perhaps he's not the ideal king either. Um you certainly get the idea that Scotland would have a better chance. But also remember, Malcolm is the rightful king. He is Duncan's heir by blood and by appointment. So when again, we're looking to the restoration of order. Malcolm has to end up as king and be really clear on that. There's always some students who talk about Banquo being king. It's not finders keepers. Malcolm is restored as king at the end of the play. But equally, perhaps he's not going to be as good a king as Duncan was either. But for the extra bonus points, and I think the thing that a lot of students always miss, is there's another king in here. Because Malcolm and the Doctor start talking about King Edward of England, who was supposedly had the healing touch. Um, so we see here with the Doctor at the bottom, I say there are a crew of wretched souls that stay his cure. Their malady convinces the greatest assay of his art, but at his touch, such sanctity hath heaven given his hand, they presently amend. So we get here the recitation that Edward is healing the sick. He is that devout um, and becomes almost the epitome of this idea of the divine right of kings and being God's representative on earth, that he has this healing touch that can heal the sick. And so we have him held up as almost the epitome of kingship. To a certain extent, he is so in tune with his role and he's serving the people. He's out there looking after the low and the Ill, Ill of his people and helping them improve, which, again, is very different to Macbeth, who hides in his castle and sends people out to be killed on his behalf. So including that gives us another aspect of kingship and reminds us of what a true king in full possession of his powers could supposedly be like. And there is a little bit of a hint in there because sometimes James tried to claim that he had a bit of a healing touch as well, or people tried to claim that about him. So there's a little bit of a little nod to James in there, but very subtle. I think a lot more of it is about the models of kingship. Um, but what's really key to remember is that whatever Malcolm is, he is being presented as very different to Macbeth and as the rightful king. And those two things are really important because Macbeth didn't just murder Duncan, he murdered the king and stole. So then at the end of the play, we get this idea of the restoration of order, which is a key feature of a lot of tragedies. The idea is that at the end of the play, some sort of order has to be restored and some sense of normality has to return. So at the very end of the play, we end on Malcolm, who is now the king. Who, so therefore, the usurper has been killed 
um, and his was it the, of, uh, the dead butcher and his fiend-like queen have been disposed of. The rightful king is in his place as the king of Scotland, who ends the play inviting all of the people on stage to see him crowned at Scone, so officially um, given his birthright. So this is really important to consider the sense that Shakespeare is saying that the important thing is that the right person is back on the throne at the right time um, in order to allow the country to heal and to recover. And almost this sense of there's an inevitability to it that right will prevail. And he's writing this at the backdrop of James having had a bit of a rocky <laughs> ascension to the throne, finally being appointed, having been attacked in the gunpowder plot, but have sort of stopped that attack happening and continuing to reign. And so Shakespeare's play is to an extent seen as a support for the status quo and a support for ensuring that the right thing continues. But this is obviously, as I say, happened against a backdrop where Shakespeare writes under two different monarchs. His career begins for Elizabeth um, and then ends under James. And there's huge upheaval and the issue of who has the right to rule England um, and Britain has been a massive political problem overshadowing the whole of Shakespeare's life. And so this idea of restoration of order comes with a little bit of bitterness in there because we have to remember Banquo's prophecy. And Banquo's prophecy at the start says that he will found a line of kings. So we end with Malcolm on the stage. Apparently, we're all happy. This is brilliant. Everything's back to normal. But we still get the sense of upheaval yet to come because in the back of our minds, we know that Banquo's issue will end up on the throne. And we know that because James himself liked to suggest that he was a descendant of Banquo's. And so this line of kings at some point in the near future is still going to be disrupted. There is still upheaval to come for Scotland. So even in this, this apparently victorious restoration at the end of the play, canny audience members will be remembering that prophecy, will be remembering Macbeth's frustration that he has done all of this for Banquo's issue and be aware that Malcolm's reign is not going to have this sense of lineage and succession and stability that might be sought um, elsewhere and be thinking about the potential consequences for that. So some final thoughts on this. Is Macbeth's greatest crime killing Duncan or usurping the throne? I think this is really interesting. If Duncan had just been a man, would this have been as interesting a play? No. So Macbeth doesn't just murder someone, he steals the throne. And the difference between those two is really important and really interesting to consider. If he had killed Duncan, but not taken the throne, would this have been as bad? All of the upheaval of the natural order seems to come from Macbeth asserting his claim to the throne almost more than anything else. And we get this sense that if Malcolm had ascended the throne, then terrible things would have been averted. But because Macbeth is able to get on the throne and therefore abuse the power because he's not fit to hold that status and to hold that power, then he is able to do these terrible things. So thinking about what Shakespeare's saying about the morality of the various crimes he commits is really interesting. It's also perhaps quite difficult for us to imagine how much influence a king was supposed to be able to have in 1606 and the significance of the monarch on the throne. Now, for all of us, we've had the same monarch on the throne um, for all of our lives, all of our parents' lives. So we have never actually dealt with this um, and particularly at Shakespeare's time, it wasn't just transfer from one to another. It was massively political upheaval every time a new monarch was appointed over the sort of hundred years um, prior to this play. And therefore, 
the influence of the king and the significance of who was on the throne, we I genuinely think we cannot comprehend in our current world. But we need to be aware of how significant that was in Shakespeare's world. So it's not just a simple thing of mm, Macbeth nicked the throne like he's nicked his football. Macbeth taking the throne is an utter betrayal of the very fundamental fabric of that society and the fear that was all the way through the um, society that the wrong person was on the throne and what that could do was absolutely palpable and therefore needs to be really carefully considered. Some people claim that Macbeth was written purely to um, make James happy and go, look, we've written a thing about Scotland and kings and witches and stuff. I think there's a lot more going on than that. I think this is a really interesting, politically motivated play, which says a lot. And yes, it very much advocates for the status quo and tells us that killing the king is bad and that terrible things will happen. But it was motivated by contemporaneous actions. It was motivated by things like the gunpowder plot, like the fears of people about who was on the throne. So it's not just a simple king's story. This is a story that actually would have felt very timely and felt like very significant political commentary. And then that final idea of is order restored at the end? So, as said, order being restored is a key component of um, tragedy um, very often. But because of the lingering effect of Banquo's prophecy, there is a sense of this play continuing after the curtain falls. And I think that's one of the most powerful things that Shakespeare does, that this order, at first glance, order appears to be restored. However, our knowledge of the play and of what happens gives us the sense of things continuing and that actually it isn't that simple and it isn't that easy and that things are much, much more complicated than it may at first appear.